hello, welcome to the Conflict Transformation Online Summit, Coming Down to Earth. We are in our second week, which is about nurturing the soil. And I have the pleasure of having with me Polly Islop. Hello, Polly, welcome. Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here with us. Polly, you are um, uh, from uh, Northway, Alaska, from the Dine clan. Mm -hmm. You hold a PhD in uh, Indigenous Peacemaking Studies, and you are actually teaching in the University of Alaska uh, Indigenous Peacemaking Practices. So I hope we're going to um, get to know a bit more about what have you been exploring through your journey professionally, personally, around the topics of peacemaking and justice. So really welcoming. And please share with us a bit of your story, your journey, who you are, where you come from. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. I'm going to uh, share um, a little bit of um, PowerPoint on um, who I am and where I'm from. Um, my name is Polly Hyslip, and I'm an, an assistant professor in, for the Indigenous Studies Program for the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. The photo here is of my son who lives in Reno, Nevada. His name is Benjamin, and of course, his little dog, Oliver. Before I begin, I'd just like to say a short prayer of, that I just basically learned in my language, the Upper Tanana River of uh, language uh, of Northway, um, and it, and I'm saying Dodi Dai Sin Ha Sinni Cho Jaho Tla Za Neka Ni Ta Ja Za Sinni Sin Si Di Ai Hong Son Su Di Neka Ni Ta Taho, and basically what I'm I'm saying is, uh, Creator, uh, thank you for today. Take care of all of us. Uh, what we are doing here, let us do it good, and take care. Take care of us. Taho means, amen. Taho. Yeah, taho. Basically, it means I'm done. We have no word to say amen in our language. That's a Christian word, but we've translated to say taho. And Dodi Tai is our creator, our spirit, our our God, or um, the universal power. Wanted to just introduce who I am. Um, this is my grandmother to the left. Her name is Bertha Dimit Sinyan. And she was born in Northway, where I'm from. And my father in the photo there is um, Floyd Hyslop. And he was born in Michigan. Yeah, and his grandfather is from Scotland. So I have Scottish blood in me. And uh, to the right is my mother, and she, her name is also Polly Hyslip, or Polly Dimmit Hyslip, and she was also born in Northway. So I, my, I was born and raised um, in the villages of Alaska, and Northway was, was where I was born. And then my father, who worked for the government, uh, relocated us to two other villages along the Yukon River. And um, so I have family that live along the Yukon River. And so I call Tanana, another village along the Yukon River, uh, my second home. And I, my clan is Nesu clan. There are seven clans in, in the upper Tanana River region of Alaska. Our clan came from Canada and we're basically known to be fighters. Um, and so there's story to every one of our clans. And so, um, so it's unusual that, um, that I'm in the field of peacemaking. This is a map of Alaska, and there, and I have a little arrow pointing to my village, Northway. It's a very small village. It's there about maybe 400 people um, there at most. And uh, but we're on the road system. Most of the villages in Alaska, and I call villages are small native communities. Are, um, are remote, meaning that you'd have to fly to the villages. With my village, you can actually drive there. We're near the Canada border. So, um, so a lot of my family are from Canada. And this is just a picture of, um, of how it looks now in um, March 
of 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 um the march where we're kind of springtime but it's still a lot of snow and these are um located here are just uh some of the uh crafts that we make in alaska and those are called moccasins I came to peacemaking through my own work in uh, restorative justice and also uh, my research uh, that I did in a Tlingit community in Southwest Alaska. And uh, the title of my, uh, my thesis is Circle Peacemaking in Cake Alaska, a case study of indigenous planning and dispute systems design. So what I did was I combined kind of the uh, indigenous ways of knowing and doing with uh, the non-indigenous ways of um, creating dispute systems within within organizations, I just kind of stretch it a little further, and then I uh, I use their um, what what the practitioners in dispute systems design, usually mediators. I just what I did was I just um, studied and evaluated what uh, they did and combined that with indigenous planning. Or, so I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, or so I tried. But uh, so here are, the, here are like eight basic principles and practices I came up with or, um, w uh, from studying uh, the Tlingit community and how they created peacemaking uh, using um, community resources, com community members as uh, people that designed the peacemaking. And um, this differs from, uh, I'd say funded type of restorative justice or funded, um, fund-based uh, programs. This uh, peacemaking in Cake Alaska was uh, developed and also um, designed by the community members who live there, and they were Tlingits. Um, there were non Tlingits there too. And one thing I wanted to say is that peacemaking doesn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight in Cake. It took about a long time. It took about um, maybe 10 years. And the reason is that, um, and I, one of the reasons is that communication is so important um, because uh, because people will not well, conflict uh, within communities is something we learn to live with and something because communities are small, we try to let, we try to ignore a lot of the problems that are happening. And that's what CAKE did for a long time, uh, the CAKE, the members of CAKE. And that's what members of my community um, do as well. Um, and so these, I, I numbered them one through eight but they're not in that order. They're in any order that they have to be. Um, so um, the real need for, in my mind or in my, as a result of my research is the need for um, trained uh, peacemakers as facilitators uh, for community change. Um, and uh, let's see, um, I call them change makers. You know, um, I don't know. I don't, I guess for a lack of a better word, I teach this class called Indigenous Dispute Systems Design, and we actually cover all eight. And this is kind of a simplified form of what, of what a facilitator or a community uh, needs to do in order to, to have a peacemaking um, process within their community. We, uh, by the way, we all have peacemaking uh, within ourselves. Um, through our value systems, um, through our practices. Um, within my own community of Northway, we may not, um, peacemaking is a process where you can sit in a, where if you're working with the court system or within the education system, where a facilitator holds a circle of people and they come up with a solution to whatever problem that's happening, you know, whatever problem they're addressing in the, in the circle. But um, but within my own community, we have traditional um, ways of resolving conflict, and the first the first way that we do not do is say we're sorry. Um, 
I think resolving conflict and creating um, a peacemaking between people is a action word. It's something that we have to do. And maybe I can just share with you like an an example. Uh, We have um, events called potlatches in our community. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's when, uh, when the community gets together to honor someone who's passed away a traditional uh, potlatch. And that is also a forum for people who are maybe um, who have been in conflict with one another to, um, to show that they, to show the public that they're willing to let it go and uh, forgive and forget perhaps. But uh, one incident happened uh, when two uh, women in our community um, it got into a, a, a bit of a fight and it was a public place and everybody knew about it. And it's a small community. So we all knew about it anyway. And, um, and they were of opposite clan. So there's rules about how we treat each other um, as, as far as how do we treat the opposite clan. So there was definitely a breakdown there. And, uh, and so when we had this open event called our potlatch, the offender or the wrongdoer came in and she had a, a, an armload of gifts and she came up to the person that she offended and she laid it down or gave it to her and that person accepted it. And when no words were exchanged, but we all knew that that was the person who accepted it, had accepted her apology or um, I, I don't know what, what you would call it. But that, and so nobody talked about it again and it was over. And so that's a kind of a tradi- tradi- one of our traditional ways of, of resolving conflict is um, to make it public. And um, because in small communities, we already know. And, and so um, I like that as a practice. But I just, um, I didn't really want to go through all eight unless there's, one that kind of jumps out at you, uh, Nuno. Um, I think that what I would, if I could redo the numbering, which I really shouldn't have numbers there, I would put, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, I'll, because it was part of my dissertation. Um, it's, um, but peacemaking is a way of life. And that's probably the one of the most important um, lessons or uh, that I learned in my research because I had tried to start a restorative justice process in my region working with the courts. And uh, there were so many reasons why it didn't happen. And that's what led me to Kate to, to understand and to learn about what did they do to uh, create peacemaking within their community. And um, I think the most important lesson I learned, and maybe it was a it was a, it w- it was basically why I went there, um, probably to learn that peacemaking is a way of life, and that just means that we have to be peacemakers um, in whatever capacity that we can be. Sometimes being peacemakers is being is um, is telling is saying hard truths that put us in a way in a really uncomfortable place um, and. I know peacemakers that are truth that are truth makers, and um, they have to be stronger, and they really should have a a uh, a, a good group of supporters um, because uh, people do not like truth. Sometimes it hurts, and it means that we have to be responsible, or um, you know, we 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 resist everything. Um, outside of our comfort zone and so to to uh, embrace peacemaking as a way of life we have to look inside and see what's creating all sorts of conflict within our minds um, because our mind it begins with our minds <laughs> our thinking um, and also um, kind of uh, coming to peace with the things that happen in our in our lives um, we, when you mentioned earlier that uh, we all, and I believe that we are all indigenous, but we all have generations. We've been we've been removed probably 
throughout the generations from from the the, the peacemakers the, the peacemakers that we are within um, because we're talking about our 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 thinking and our and and our hearts um, and so peacemakers really work from the heart and so how do I as a peacemaker become you know go from especially when I'm in academia go from my thinking to my heart and um, that's the journey uh, that we as peacemakers uh, as as indigenous people um, have to make um, my people uh, from the upper Tanana River of Alaska we were the last in Alaska to be colonized and the reason is is because there was nothing that the outsiders wanted. We had nothing that they wanted. So we were actually left alone for until um, the Second World War when they built the highway through our traditional tor territory, the Alaska Highway. And so our, our, um, our lives were changed dramatically. And then we had to deal with um, the, the school system that removed our children from uh, their homes and put them in boarding schools we had to deal with all sorts of other messages that told us that we were savages and that we had um, we didn't know how to live and we had to be taught. And also, um, in my mother's generation, there was there were also the signs that said "No dogs and are uh, natives allowed." And so we had we had within a short amount of time, and we were catapulted into a system that. The native people didn't understand, nor still do they understand, because there are two systems. Kind of, there are two systems here in Alaska. They one, coexist. Yeah, and one is the Anglo-American system, and one is the um, native system, or the native ways of knowing and doing. And so, so we're always kind of balancing between both, and um, and we can't we can't live in one system. We have to, we have to learn to adjust to the other system. And one thing that um, people, Native people, have been is, is, is resilient to all this uh, change because we're still here, <laughs> and we still, we still have a great value system that uh, teaches us to care for one another. And the, my region of Alaska is probably the coldest place on the planet. Uh, <laughs> maybe not, but it's still very cold. So people had to help each other to survive. They had to look out for one another. And that's still a pretty strong value system when it comes to somebody, uh, tragedy in our community. We all gather together, we all help. And um, so I'm pretty proud of my community in that respect. But we've also had all sorts of changes that happen that's created all sorts of um, issues or problems within our community that um, we're facing now, we're coming out of what the phase of what they call the dependency, where we were told that um, they had to teach us or they had to show us how to live. And um, we're, st we're starting now to reclaim um, our, our, our traditional values. And uh, for me, the most exciting part is, is knowing um, that is language, is like our language uh, creates that relationship to our worldview. Like we begin to think the way our my grandmother thought and my mother actually, because my mother was, she was the last generation to speak um, our, our Upper Tanana uh, language as her first language. I'm the first generation to speak English as my first language. So there, So the changes have been incredibly enormous. But what we do value now is that we know that we have, we have the answer to good living. And the answer is, um, is, is to be close to our Mother Earth, um, to recognize that there's spirit in all living things and that, uh, that we can, that we can cre recreate that relationship. And that also to the spirit world. Our language creates a lot of relationship to the spirit world. Um, when my when my aunt tells me, "Oh, ina itzi," that means uh, basically watch what you're saying uh, because I'm violating something very 
it's it's a huge term because I'm I'm violating if I'm saying something and that's um, it's not what I should be saying or doing something I shouldn't be doing. I'm not only representing me. I'm representing my grandmother who's passed into the spirit world, my family, my clan, and the ones yet to be born. So there's there's also to relationships that are uh, that we don't hear in the Anglo American world or what you call the Western world. We don't we're we're not taught that. Um, maybe you know the Christianity has taken something that's very sacred um, because. Uh, you know, the, Jesus taught some very sacred lessons that um, are universal. But once um, once it becomes once it becomes more, I can't think of the word for now. But it, um, if, once it get, it gets locked into kind of a, and you you probably have the term, but a box or sort, then it loses mm-hmm. it loses something very um, very valuable. Um, because well, Polly, yeah, you, you, it's. I, I was hearing you. You opened so many things. Now I was thinking, like, hmm, it's uh, really amazing what you just shared. And, and in in relation to language, what I can see from my own language, from Portuguese, and I think also from English, and most of the of the written languages, is this kind of there was this development where. Um, through language, we learn to discriminate things and separate. So there's, you know, there's in the grammar, there's this relationship between subject and object. And always our, our language is constructed in that way, which in a way is already creating this kind of separation in our analytical mind between us and the world we observe around us and, and things. So it's interesting what you bring that language actually that that your own language has, is deeply embedded in 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 deeper ways of, of of understanding how much connected you are to the land and to the, the ecosystem you you are part of. Perhaps one thing you can do is stop the the sharing the screen so we can see you. Oh, I don't know if you yeah. have any uh, something else to share. Otherwise, no, that was it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, great. So. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking that p- perhaps one place I, I would like to to start asking you is if you could give us a bit more of, of insights or, or of your own view of this the the essential differences and and maybe subtleties between what you notice in the way in the way we think and exercise justice from these institutional places you know and in a way from the Anglo-Saxonic. Uh, perspective Mm -hmm. and in comparison with some of the things you mentioned about restorative justice relation relational justice and and how that is deeply embedded and hold by the community so i'm really curious to see like what do you see are at the heart what at the heart is kind of different so that we could maybe also in a way enlarge our own understanding of what what is justice or how to relate with justice in, in different ways yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I think that um, for me, I've always had a hard time with the word justice. It's just, it's not something that I can actually understand what it means. But I, I do know that from my own experience, and I, maybe, I don't even know how to replace the word justice, except um, not to replace it, or <laughs> so, maybe redefine it. But um, from my own experience, but for uh, instance, Polly, in your in your in in your language in in your native language, you don't have a word like justice. You have other words to like harmony or. Uh, I think that what we have mostly, uh, and we're very we're very practical people because we had to live to survive, right, <laughs> in our world. But I think what the biggest emphasis on is on just following the good way and the good way is is to is taught to us it's taught to us by our the our elders by the people who have uh, lived a good life uh, so there are there are teachers and they and so becoming basically being a good person and so um, that to me um, is the is probably the most powerful um, kind of lesson that I have to live up to 
um, because success in the Anglo-American world is so different from success in the Native world. Uh, success or being a good person, you know, um, because I have a college degree. Well, I have three now. Um, <laughs> I, I'll never forget when the chancellor from my university went down to uh, the graduation within my region at a smaller college. And he, um, he introduced me to the people that basically know me. And he said that she had attained the highest degree in the academic world. And actually, you know, it's like, that's kind of mind boggling, but he, but the, the, the look that from the audience is like, we don't know what that means, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but but and so I was always laughing because what they were probably thinking is, can she cut fish? Can she fish? Can she sew? Can she, can she do this? Uh, you know, is she a good person? Does she look out for her family? See, those value systems are so different um, because in the, and even in our language, there's, there, there are not, there's so many, we, we talk about we, we never talk about me, like I, there's very few terms that refer to me, me, me. And so the English language actually talks a lot about me and they, uh, they objectify um, uh, things like, you know, people, places and things. Our language creates a relationship to everything. I'll never forget when my grandmother said, um, when the snow started falling on the trees before the weather became cold, she said, look, the trees are all dressed up. They're ready for winter. So I'm thinking <laughs> those are trees. They're not people. So, you know, so it's like, um, it's been an amazing journey for me because I left the village. I received my degree. I lived and worked in New York city and then I came back. And so, um, and so that the, so I had to relearn a lot of what I had learned outside. So I have like two knowledge systems within me and we all do. I think we all do. And I, to me, we also have the, the traditional knowledge system that connects us to the, to the world of the spirit. And the world of the spirit is important to me because it makes, it helps me to recognize that there, that we, we are not on top of the food chain. We are part of, we're part of everything. Uh, and and my relationship to 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 the planet is um, uh, they recognize my relationship. There was a time I was told when humans and animals talk together, and then uh, humans start started to disrespect the animals, and so the animals stopped talking to us. And so what's happening today um, with planet with our Earth, our mother? She's a little bit mad at us and a uh, lot bit because we are disrespecting her. And to, to get, uh, through our lifestyles, through allowing uh, just, just, for, just for being um, quiet, perhaps, when, when we should have voices uh, and, and to stick up um, for our, our mother because she is the one that gives us life. Um, the water, the air. And, um, you know, so today, um, I don't know if, if today is a day that uh, we, um, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. And mm -hmm. so it's, um, it's for us to stop and to think, how did we get here? You know, and, uh, and so we basically need to become humans again. And how, how does that work? And so, um, and so can, can you share like how, how you see, for instance, the relevance of restorative justice of uh, an, another way to think about, uh, I hear you talk about responsibility that, that you have, that each person has to have responsibility for not only their, the, their own closed sphere, but responsibility to the larger holes they are part of, the community, the ecosystem they live in. Okay. And, and I wonder, occasionally in our living together, uh, there's, there's tensions and conflicts that arise. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see how, how in there there's, how, how you deal with this and how you see it. Uh, 
Well, the word restorative justice is a word that is a term that isn't our term. It's a term that's a good term. It's restoring something, you know. <laughs> um, but um, what what we call it is, um, if we can get a little closer to what I was, what I'm talking about, our values, our traditional teaching, we're restoring our values, or we're returning back to our values and our our teaching that show us how to be good people. If you want to, if you want me to compare how the Anglo-American system works or the Western system works, they they like punishment. They like to put away the. My heart is close to the young people uh, that get into trouble in communities. Um, they put them away in, in uh, juvenile homes. They separate them from the family, um, and that rarely ever 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 restores anything. A restorative justice process is where the community comes together, they, they, usually with the, with the training of a very good facilitator. And they sit down and they address the, the wrongdoer because if there's a wrongdoer, there's, you're, there are usually um, victims, people who've been impacted. And they sit and they, and they, talk, to, they talk together and they come up with, with with solutions, how can they get to where they want to go? How can they create safer communities? Um, how can the wrongdoer uh, repay, uh, make it right uh, to the people that uh, he or she ha have um, hurt? And so it's a really incredibly powerful process. It can be done through what's, I what Cake did through their peacemaking circle um, it can be done within cities through the restorative justice process. It, it can be accomplished to creating uh, kinder uh, criminal justice systems through uh, what is called therapeutic jurisprudence. It's just becoming. Let's look at it, let's look at one another as humans and um, not as a, 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 a person who's committed a crime. It's not to say that criminal justice systems. Uh, need to disappear there's a reason for them and there are people who will uh, who will probably never get well and so there's a reason to have um, the criminal justice system but when when it comes down to young people who get into trouble um, only and the reason is because I've seen it happen within my community where our young people are taken from our community and because we can we cannot as even family members uh, stay in touch with them, they come back strangers to us, and then they then we we have no idea what happened when they when they left. Where did they go? What you know? What it's so it's it's a very unkind system uh, for our young people and for everyone. But young people, uh, I just have a because it's happened within my own family, um, and I have a family member who has spent nearly his entire life behind bars. And, and it, I think that the process could have um, had a better outcome if we had a, a peacemaking circle. Because yeah, actually, has, yeah, it, it, I was thinking in the States today, it's, it's more expensive to have someone incarcerated than to actually pay for his um, studies in, a, in, in any of the, even the Ivy League uh, colleges, which is kind of really shocking. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm, um, I'm not quite sure why uh, the states would want, prefer to spend a lot more money to lock people up, except that maybe it's a business, it's a lucrative business, you know, so, um, you know. But I think also it, it might come from, so one of the things you, you are, I'm hearing you saying is um, in, in, uh, in, in your local community uh, any wrongdoing or any conflict that emerges between between people is 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 held by the community it's not something that okay you deal with your own thing solely everything is kind of um, responsibility also of the collective which I find really interesting and and I, I see it from the way I was hearing as there's all it's held in a way that tries to 
support people reconnecting to their sense of being a good person and and you know uh, being responsible for uh, things more than just themselves and and I just rem remembered one of the things I discovered uh, in the last few years that was really interesting was this notion from some native uh, clans from the lake area the, the big lakes area that they have this notion of a kind of cannibal spirit called duetico or in some of the languages would be windigo which occasionally some people a, a person in the community would have this kind of spirit of wanting everything for him or herself or being too much exploitative and the whole community would would help uh, this person come back to a to, to to a healthy state what they would consider a healthy state and i think maybe when they met the, the the white people coming in they felt like this the whole culture is wetico so the whole culture is possessed by this spirit by this energy of wanting to take things and part of what is probably there for me and wh when what i see in, in justice and 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 imprisonment systems is is just that we are kind of uh contributing for people to get stuck in end endless cycles of becoming the bad people, you know, like just being labeled that way. And like, it's, this is who you are instead of you are uh, for many reasons, mostly also dependent on the context. You came to do some wrong, wrongdoing. How can we help you realign with that and learn with that and, and, keep your path you know like of, of of a good person that's what i'm hearing i don't know if this invokes something else in you but well i guess <clears throat> what i really wanted to stress also is that uh is that our communities are affected by by colonialism we you know um there is no perfect model you know uh we have our problems in our small communities um, because we've lost our way because of the uh, of the systems that that imposed were imposed upon us, we're coming back and there, and to to come back to a life of peacemaking requires a lot of truth. You know, of of what I do is a as a um, instructor. Uh, what I teach my I teach uh, indigenous um, research in native communities. But I also, but what I always ask, I always require of my students is that they begin to ask the questions, you know, what is it that I want to know? What is it that I want to, basically what we start off with is we need to begin to question what the messages are in our society. Why are we doing what we're doing? Because the, those are messages and who's telling us, says who? Uh, so I think it takes a lot of um, critical thinking to just stop and say, "Whoa, why am I, why am I doing this? Why am I living like this? Why am I feeling this way?" And so it doesn't. So it's not everybody who's going to do that because there are a lot of people who just do not question anything, and they're happy to get up and go to work and put in their eight hours or and get their paycheck. Um, and but there are people like you like many of the people who are viewing uh, this recording now, are people who are asking, who are saying, there must be a better way. How did we get here? Because we, we all came from the land. We all started off as, as people of the land with relationships to the animals and to, to the rivers and to, to all that's living. What happened? Because... I'm not one to, I really do not like to, to differentiate, you know, the Anglo-American from the indigenous um, because we're all humans. We all started off as humans. And so it, indigenous to me just means my relationship to the land. I'm close to the land where I was born. And I'm really fortunate because um, where, I, where, I, where I come from and where I live, that's the land of my birth and it's a land of my mothers and my grandmothers and the people for generations what we were from there so the the mountains mean something to us the the rivers they all have native names although they've been renamed so um so 
I don't know what, I guess what I'm saying is that peacemaking, um, and I'm, and, and, um, and, and, and laying or, or planting the seeds into, uh, the soil, you know, um, we all, we're here because we're searching, we're searching for another way of, of living because we, I think a lot of us have realized that the systems that are in place are broken. They're not working. They've been like, even the education system, if there's, there's, it's been bureaucratized. And so when there are too many people and too many rules, things break down. Uh, one thing I did learn is that we all, there is the law of the land. We all know the values or we all, we should know, or and we should uh, have within us a value system that honors life, uh, that honors one another, uh, that seeks to help out one another. That's what peacemaking is. It's just basically looking out for one another. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's just really, that's the bottom line. Let's look out for one another. And let's let's take care let's take care of each other because if we do that with the with our mother the earth she will give us back she will let us live again and until then I don't know uh, she'll live on we might not <laughs> <laughs> she will definitely continue yeah. I interviewed another another. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Satoris, which is a world-renowned expert on on uh, evolutionary biology, and she told me this amazing story. And to the audience, this amazing story about the evolution of life in the planet and how the first four billion years was the planet was occupied by this bacteria, this uni, uh, this this uh, little creatures, the most simple living organisms that would eat everything they would find uh, uh, to a point that they almost killed themselves. They were competing for resources until they were so near extinction that they uh, jumped to another stage of their evolution where they started to collaborate and they created what we now call a cell, a nuclear cell. So they got all these bacteria living together, collaborating, created a cell and created a way of producing energy that was called photosynthesis. Then they spend another two billions fighting each other for resources until they pass to the mature phase, creating multicellular organisms. So maybe we are also in that stage of uh, being invited to move towards a mature human species that is based on collaboration. So I really hear you. And I was wondering, like, we, got, we are getting close to the end and there were some things that I really would be would be great to leave to the to our uh, listeners is you talk about peacemaking as a way of life so in a way as a way of being and uh, and you already mentioned a, a, a few things one of them is this critical thinking another i i into it uh, hearing you is like courage courage to step forward and to, you know assume your wrongdoings or to name out things that were that are kind of uh, taking us away from the good path, the good life, and uh, being a good person. What other elements have you found in your journey that you think are really crucial that you can say, help people say, look, if you want to work in your groups towards social change, be, be a, a change agent, and you want to work with conflicts in this kind of regenerative way as a peace, peacemaking and, you know, being being always looking for the point of that we keep doing together things and learning with our own uh, tensions and conflicts. What what else would you would you advise from from your journey that you think is relevant for people to work with? I think the most important is just is to have that vision of the life that you're that you're working towards, and the um, because uh, to have to have safe communities and to have healthy communities, we have to know what you know. We have to know what it looks like or envision what it looks like or for me it's basically answering to a calling you know like um i never wanted to to i guess i wanted to be uh, part of the language revitalization but i never really wanted to be part of it um, because i was gone for 30 years from my community 
And so, um, so I envision, so it's like becoming visionaries. Like, so I envision us talking to each other in our language. Like, and so what I did was I created a language circle. And so we're learning to talk to each other. Even if, I mean, even if we have to say thank you, if we say thank you in our language, we're learning to say tini. And we're learning to say see you later, nanang il. So we're learning every time we say a word in our language, we're really, we're, we're revitalizing um, and honoring our language. And so it just starts with one step at a time. So and to envision peacemaking, I have to, and the, and the people in CAKE, they just, they just answered to their calling. They just, um, we all must have a calling. I feel we do because of my own personal experience. Um, because I never wanted that responsibility. I never wanted to be a, a PhD in Indigenous Studies, but I answered to that calling and that privilege. And in Hawaii, they have this term called kuleana. And that means that uh, we have a responsibility. So we have to answer to our responsibility. And sometimes it's a lonely journey. And because, they're, because we're, we're few and far between as peacemakers. And so we just, we have to have that vision because what we're envisioning may not happen in our lifetime. It may happen um, several lifetimes later, but we, ha we have to start with now. We have to start with the first step. And, uh, and so I think the most important for me, because there'll be conflict along the way, what I learned in my study and in the field of dispute systems design is that um, there'll be resistance. You know, we'll face resistance all along the way because we're creatures of habit. We like our comfort zone, whether it's uncomfortable, we still like it. So to, to, want, to step outside that comfort zone will resist, even if it means good change. So, so um, peace, peacemakers, change makers, we have to be, we should be prepared, like prepared for the resistance because it will come. Uh, there will be, there will be criticizers. There'll be all sorts of things, but we have to know that, that, you know, maybe that's our calling. Maybe that's why we're here because the earth needs us. The earth needs peacemakers. Um, and there've been peacemakers through the generations. And so, um, and so, but, but if that's what we want and that we envision a, a, a healthier community, a safer community, families that, that really actually enjoy being home with their children, you know, maybe we should stop and think, why do, why do we have to be working two jobs? Why, why do we have to have that huge house? Maybe that's not the message that we want anymore, you know? So peacemakers, change makers, we may have to recreate a return back to maybe a, a form of life that actually did work, you know, um, because, because within my community, we're, we helped out each other a lot. We looked out for each other. We, and so why can't we start doing that again? We shouldn't let busy get in our way. Yeah. I guess I, I kind of let everything, I mean, I said a lot in two minutes. Yeah, well, one, one of the things that really uh, I resonate a lot is this um, notion that each one of us is unique and brings something unique to the world. So if we start to try to support each other to, to uh, uh, create possibilities for that to come to life, it's, we are already shifting. And instead of saying, oh, this person is a problem in the group or there's this uh, personalization of, of some traits that are not uh, well received by others towards a more like well, how can we honor what each one of us uh, has to give uh, and, and support each other in that pro in that way so we are closing I, I i would like to still invite you to to say some final things a final message something you, you want to leave to the audience it has been an amazing uh, conversation um what do you like to say Pauline? I'm, I'm just really honored that um, to be here and to be part of this incredible process of, of change. Um, I just can't help but say that I can hear birds in your background there. <laughs> and it's, it's beautiful because I'm, I'm, I'm talking here from Alaska where we're still in our winter. And so we're, we, have, we haven't seen green yet. 
So, um, you know, um, but uh, yes, I just, I know that we'll, we'll cross paths again um, because, um, because this is incredible energy that's happening all over the world. And so for you and I could, to connect um, using technology, we're doing, we're making the best of everything. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for, for showing up. It, is a, it has been a privilege, a pleasure. I feel so grateful that we have this opportunity to have you talking from Fairbanks in Alaska. I'm here holding this space from Dili, from the tropics, and uh, hopefully you are all scattered around the planet uh, having the chance to, to get in touch with some of these uh, different ways of seeing, of being, and opening up new possibilities for us to to approach the, the challenging times we have in a more more healthy and generative way. So, Polly, thank you so much for, for showing up. And, yeah, we'll, we are most definitely connected, so we'll, we'll keep in touch. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.